Last night, President Joe Biden gave his annual State of the Union address. The president highlighted his stances on taxes, foreign policy, and even reproductive rights. He called out Republicans for not supporting a bipartisan border security bill. And he blasted former President Donald Trump, without naming him, of course, for quote unquote bowing down to Russian President Vladimir Putin. There's a couple of opinions, a few actually, that I have on the State of the Union address. First things first, let's talk about President Biden for a second. Because while you had an abundance of people on the left who want to bring up how they saw this man and they said, hey, you know what? He looks fiery, so much fervor, so much energy. And you had the left wanting to make a big deal about that, right? Let me show y'all what that's the equivalent of. Are you watching? Cameraman, stay with me. Stay with me. Are you ready? Are you ready? So guess what? That means I can run five miles now? That means I'm in shape? What the hell does that mean that Joe Biden looked like he had energy last night? The question is, can you rely on him to do that for four years starting next year? That's the question. He gives a speech for an hour and 10 minutes or so on a weeknight in March of 2024, and suddenly that warrants four more years for a dude that's going to turn 82 years of age in November and is expected to give four more years after that? I said before and I'll say it again. It is an utter disgrace that in the year 2024, the Democratic Party, who calls itself progressives, is begging and relying upon an 82 year old to come save the day for 2025, 2026, 2027, in the 2028. And if you think that an hour speech offsets all of that, you smoke and crack. I'm worried. Age matters at this point in time with a Joe Biden because we've seen some slippage. He didn't look that way last night. Give him credit for that. But it doesn't amount to a hill of beans in the grand scheme of things when you're talking about four more years. That's the only point that I wanted to make about him and how energetic he looked during his speech last night. Now let's get on to another topic because it involves somebody else that, quite frankly, I'm not that fond of. It's Marjorie Taylor Greene, representative who's made a scene at every one of Biden's State of the Union addresses. It continued Thursday night as she showed up in a bright red MAGA outfit. She tried to engage the president as he walked into the House chamber. Green could be seen telling Biden to, quote, say her name, end quote, an apparent reference to Lakin Riley, a 22-year-old nursing student who was allegedly murdered by an undocumented immigrant. The president did not address Green, not at that moment, but later in the speech he mentioned Riley and held up a button acknowledging she was killed by, quote, an illegal, a name Democrats usually avoid saying. First things first, I think it's important to recognize that it's kind of heinous to accuse any individual of being responsible for someone's murder. There are an abundance of things that we see taking place on Capitol Hill that we're not happy about. We see politicians on both sides of the aisle seemingly incapable or at the very least unwilling to make things happen, to reach chords that would best benefit our society as a whole. And so if you're looking at it from that generic perspective, I can get how you can talk about laws or lack thereof impeding our ability to govern our society to our liking and as a result having a negative impact in some way, shape, form or fashion. But with such ease and such indifference to associate the president of the United States with murder over something like that, I think that's a bit cruel. That's number one. Number two, Marjorie Taylor Greene could come up in whatever outfit she wants to come up with. But it's pretty sad 
when you see the way some of these politicians act, the latest being her. We've seen politicians in the past, like a former representative screaming, you lie at former President Barack Obama when he was given his State of the Union address. A level of decorum from our politicians would be helpful because when you have something to do with legislating our lives, it would be nice if you conducted yourself with some class and decorum. That way society could use that as an example at which to model itself after and maybe we too will learn to operate with decorum and class and conduct ourselves appropriately. But when y'all ain't doing it, you're damn sure ain't in no position to tell somebody else they should be doing it. Marjorie Taylor Greene, on far too many occasions, conducts herself as a person who emits very little class, all because she wants to make noise. You can do it in a professional and classy manner and make your point. You don't have to act the way she's acted sometimes. It's part of our problem today. It really, really is. And that's all I'm gonna say about that because it's a more important subject to get with. And that is when I'm talking about the official Republican response that was delivered by freshman Alabama Senator Katie Britt last night. Britt sat at her kitchen table and delivered a 17 minute speech that was quite the rebuttal and focused heavily on immigration and the economy. When she got into Biden and some of the things that he was saying about his immigration policies, about the economy, and she was breaking stuff down, it was a very riveting speech. At the very least, we have to say that. One minute she looked like a stay-at-home mom speaking glowingly about family and unity and what have you. The next minute she's talking about immigration and she's talking about the violence in the streets of America and she's talking about a questionable economy, at least in the eyes of the GOP, and she demonstratively, I might add, came across very, very disturbed and alarmed at what she was seeing. To some people, it didn't look too becoming to others on the right side of the aisle, it looked very palpable, it looked powerful, it resonated in a fashion that would serve to scare some on the right to make sure they showed up to the polls to support Donald Trump over Joe Biden. Obviously, as a freshman senator and the first female senator from the state of Alabama, you know, elected into office, that resonates as well. It, didn't, wasn't, it wasn't more than a mere coincidence that she's half the age of Joe Biden as well. So all of those things come into play. And when he brings up reproductive rights, or well, she's a woman that's saying, excuse me, what about pro-life? And what a lot of people don't pay attention to, at least as far as I'm concerned, not enough of, is that for every woman out there that's about pro-choice, you have an abundance of women out there who are pro-life. It ain't the men always making these decisions. It's the women behind them saying, do this, do this, do that. Some in Capitol Hill, some in the home. So you have an abundance of women out there that are making decisions about women's reproductive rights. It's not just men thinking you get the right to tell a woman what to do with their bodies. You have women who are behind them saying this is what it should be. It's going to be an interesting election. This is our situation. A 77 year old going on 78 years old who has four indictments and 91 counts against him who could very well be a convicted felon by the time the election rolls around as the GOP nominee against a guy in Joe Biden who's going to be 82 years of age in November, whose cognitive abilities and awareness are repeatedly being brought into question, who some are saying won't even last wondering whether or not he'll even be the nominee once the Democratic National Convention rolls around, although we've received no indication that anything will change. It's Joe Biden versus Donald Trump again. Whether we like it or not, we've got to pick a side. You saw what you saw last night. Let's see if that momentum continues going forward before you decide who you're going to pick. But the one thing that needs to be assured is that one way or another, we at least go to the polls and vote. There's no such thing. There's no excuse for sitting on the sidelines and doing absolutely nothing. That's not how change takes place. That's not how things get done, period.